Wat een geweldige lieder. En heel erg bedankt voor het spannende begin van Shireen Farag en Leon de Graaf. Heerlijk dat jullie er allemaal zijn. Welcome to the speakers, old friends, new friends. Together we are going to make a fantastic pink. This year will be different. Different for you, for the team and for myself. 14 years ago, Peter and I started Pink together. Before that, we worked 25 years together in the publishing house. A team, you can say. Uh, last March, Peter suddenly passed away. So today is the first time I announce Pink. And you will see me the rest of the day from time to time. Our Pink friend, Adrian van Dis, will be the host today. He immediately offered me to help me. And I'm very thankful, because Adrian is not only a professional, but he's also, he has the pink warms. First, I have to, of course, I have to do some practical information. Pink is a bilingual conference, and for our English-speaking guests, we have a translator. In the atrium, there is a, again the bookshop of Bruce, and they have a great collection. There are a lot of authors in the audience, so if you want to have your book signed, please ask them. They're happy to do that. Do switch on your mobile phones when you leave the auditorium for the breaks, the lunch, and dinner. We don't have questions and answers. All the speakers have a purple badge. Make them feel home and ask your questions. They would love it. And finally, and very important, I would like to thank our golden sponsor Van Harte and Linksma. And I think nearly everybody in the audience knows what it is to have support from somebody to help you make your dream true. I would like to have an applause <laughs> for Van Harte. Adrian, please come on stage in Start Pink. Oh, Let's start with the dance. Yeah. Goedemorgen, dames en heren. Um, Peter van Lindon kan ik niet vervangen, maar ik weet dat hij altijd een ding met een clip droeg. Dus ik heb gisteren zitten rommel in mijn laas en een clip meegenomen. Misschien helpt dat. Ja, het zal anders zijn. Ik heb Peter vooral leren kennen als uitgever. En ik sta hier misschien wel als een beetje zijn schrijver. En wil hem eren door te presenteren. Gaat vast mis, maar dat uh, moeten we maar vergeven. We beginnen met Chris Linder. Chris Linder heeft een Hollandse moeder die op haar twaalfde uit Rotterdam de zee overging. Haar vader was een kleermaker. Ik hoorde een verhaal van armoede, ellende, gebrek aan centrale verwarming en rillen. Ik zie me die moeder zo hangend over de reling starend naar de zee. Ze zou niet weten toen kon niet weten dat ze een oceanograaf zou baren. Uh, een man die van de zee houdt, en vooral van koele zeeën... en van ijskoude gebieden, Antarctica, Poolzeeën. Dat is zijn gebied. En Chris is niet alleen een wetenschapper, maar ook een fotograaf. Hij legt wetenschappelijke expedities vast. Hij heeft er al 33 vastgelegd. Per jaar is hij drie... Vier maanden van huis. En ik zei, goh, is dat niet een recept voor een goed huwelijk? Maar toen had hij het over zijn kindertjes die hem soms niet helemaal herkende als hij terugkwam. Chris maakt die foto's omdat hij daarmee iets wil vastleggen, maar ook iets wil vertellen. Namelijk hoe belangrijk het is om wetenschappelijk onderzoek te plegen. Hij probeert een brug te slaan tussen de mensen die bladeren in een boek of naar de tentoonstelling van zijn foto's gaan. Want hij hangt in alle musea en is in vele tijdschriften gepubliceerd. Maar wil soms ook vertellen, blijf hier met je poten vanaf. Zo, nu ga ik mijn bril opzetten. Dat is het eigenlijk. The floor to Chris Linder. Where are you? Oh, there. 
Merci. This will be in English. My, I only remember two words from my, my childhood. My mother never taught me Dutch, unfortunately. Moya boom. So, <laughs> nice tree for those. <laughs> uh, so, what do you, what do you picture when, when you hear the word scientist? Uh, for, in a recent poll, 47% of people, when asked to name a scientist, came up with Albert Einstein. Uh, and no offense against Albert Einstein, genius scientist, of course, but he's been dead for 50 years. And so it's incredible that that is still the, the, uh, the stereotype that persists. And for many people, this, uh, uh, the stereotype of a scientist is working in a laboratory, white coat, test tubes, blackboards. Um, but as a former oceanographer, I know that this is also a laboratory for scientists. This is also a laboratory for scientists. And uh, scientists are doing incredible work all around the world in uh, the most remote and harsh environments you can picture. And their dedication and passion to their work is what really inspired me um, as a young oceanographer to switch my career from doing oceanography to actually documenting what the scientists are doing. Because I would get back from these trips, I would talk to my neighbors, I'd talk to people, and I'd tell them about what I just did, and they said, that's incredible, I've never, I've never heard of this, or I've never, I would have never known about this. And so I said, well, you need to know, and I'm going to make you, I'm going to teach you um, what's happening out there. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of scientific results that are communicated. I think the media is very good at communicating uh, the results of scientific research, what, uh, you know, what comes out of, of the work in the field. What I want to communicate is how it gets done. You know, how the scientists, how you, how you live on the Greenland ice sheet, what scientists eat in a camp in a penguin colony. You know, what, what drives these people? What, what makes them so passionate about their work? And so this is really what, uh, uh, what drives me, is their, their passion. And uh, so I'm going to tell you, um, I'm going to take you on two virtual journeys today to two very special places at the opposite ends of the world. They're very special places and very, very unique. So let's start in Russia. Okay, so this is about permafrost research in Siberia. Siberia here stretches from the Ural Mountains all the way uh, to the Pacific Ocean. It's Siberia in itself, if you add up the land area, is actually 10% of the land surface of the entire Earth. It's a giant, giant space of land. Siberia is also the Arctic. Most of it is above the Arctic Circle. So really, although much, much, a great portion of scientific research about the Arctic is done in Canada and in Alaska, really, the Arctic is Siberia. But it's a very difficult place to work. Hey, the temperatures are extreme. You know, this was taken in, in March. It was uh, the average temperature in Siberia in March is 40 below zero uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, but ancient cultures persist here. It's a, it's a remarkable place. Uh, in the summertime, when the sun circles overhead around and around and never sets, um, the landscape changes from this frozen wasteland Flowers bloom like this Arctic cotton grass. The whole landscape is transformed for these brief summer months. I've seen great, great owls feeding their chicks in the trees. At night, you hear their calls over this lake. This was shot at 3 in the morning. This is as low as the sun gets in July as it skims above the top of the taiga forest and then comes back up. By breakfast time, it's already, the sun is already high in the sky. So Dr. Max Holmes from the Woods Hole Research Center in Massachusetts has been bringing a big group of, of US uh, and European scientists to Russia, to this remote corner of Russia in, uh, in uh, the city of Chersky uh, to do research on permafrost. And what's unique about the group that he brings is that many of the students have never been, some of them have never been out of the country before, they've never traveled before at all. Uh, they're undergraduates. So he brings a group of about a dozen undergraduates and then associated postdoctoral uh, students and PhD students as well. We live in this place. Uh, it's, a, it's a tiny little laboratory called the Northeast Science Station. It was founded by Sergei Zimov, okay, a, uh, a genius of a scientist that's been working here and living here since 1977, right here at the edge, edge of Siberia. Um, he uh, has a number of revolutionary, you could say, ideas about, about how to do science in the Arctic. Um, his, his experience is just invaluable to us when we're there, and he's a mentor to us while we're there and to the young students. We live on this barge. Sergei traded a, a Jeep for this barge after the collapse of the Soviet Union. 
It's a great story that his son tells. He said, my dad traded Jeep for this barge. And so it has no power, but we can uh, attach a boat to it that has power and travel all the way up to the Arctic Ocean or, or, um, or uh, upriver up to an exposed riverbank called Devani Yar. And I'll show you all these places. So uh, Siberia is not without its share of hazards in the, of working in the field. This is probably the, the most annoying hazard is, that, uh, is, the, is the bugs, and anywhere in the Arctic you'll, you'll see this, but uh, Siberian mosquitoes appear to be particularly large. Um, we had a little contest to see how many you could kill with one hand slap, like this, and, and you count all the dead bodies, and so the record, I think, was 33, the one year I was there. <laughs> Sergei Zimov would say, he'd say, if you, if you put out your hand and you catch 10 mosquitoes, then there are mosquitoes. Otherwise, there are no mosquitoes. <laughs> so, he never wore a head net. He, he, never, he just smoked, so it was no problem for him. Okay, and there's another hazard to working here. This is the exposed riverbank of Devani Yar. As this permafrost is thawing, it makes this kind of gooey morass. And, uh, and uh, here he's giving a safety lecture. If you will jump in the slope, it will quickly produce this sledge. And all of this soil will move like lavinas. Do you understand? Landslide. And you will quickly die. It might be in five seconds. <laughs> Therefore, don't keep your boots. It's something dangerous. Immediately moved up like crocodile. <laughs> then you will build the bridge and will take your boots. Don't be modest. It's not so dangerous to be dirty. It's most important to be survivor. Do you understand? Yes. yes. Let's go. So, that was, these are not to scale. These, these mosquitoes are actually not bigger than our heads, but they're, they're close to the lens, so it's a little, bit, uh, a little bit deceptive. So after that lecture, you know, you're pretty careful. And this is the first thing he tells you when you get off the boat at this, at this place called Devani Yar. And so you may be wondering now, why would anyone, anyone choose to go to this place willingly? Um, you know, to, t to travel, for me, traveling from Seattle, we have to go through Moscow. So it's 19 time zones east, three overnight flights to get to this place. From the sky, this is what it looks like. It's basically a swamp in the summer. Uh, but it didn't always look like this. During the, the Pleistocene from 2.5 million to 10,000 years ago, this was a tundra steppe grassland. Uh, so there were no lakes like this. There were not as many mosquitoes, I can imagine. But there were woolly mammoths, woolly rhinoceros, saber-toothed tigers, Pleistocene horse, were all roaming this landscape, and prehistoric man. And so these, these bones, this is a, probably a hip bone and a, and a leg of, of some giant uh, Pleistocene creature. These bones are actually just coming out of the mud here at Devani Yards as permafrost thaws down. This is where all the woolly mammoth babies are found and the ones you read about in National Geographic and things like that. Um, but what, what's really the, the scientific driver, why the scientists are interested in this area, is it wasn't glaciated during the last ice age. For these uh, thousands of years, this carbon that's contained in the living creatures and in the plants, the grasslands, would keep getting compacted into the soil again and again and again, and then freeze in the winter because the temperature was so low into this, which is this little bit of frozen mud, is permafrost. And in Siberia, this layer of frozen soil, permafrost is defined as any dirt that's frozen for more than a year continuously. It can extend as much as 1,500 meters below the surface. That's the maximum extent. So the, the, uh, this frozen soil extends all this way down. And really what it is is just this locker of ancient carbon. It's all locked up in this frozen soil. And now it, was it may be surprising if you add up all the carbon and all the forests on the planet, take all the forests, all the trees, all the leaves, all the trunks, everything, you add it all up, and you add up all the carbon in permafrost soil, permafrost soil has four times as much carbon as all those forests put together. And that's just in the permafrost. So the big concern is, you know, as this permafrost is thawing, and it starts to look like this, um, all these shiny parts is, is ice. So you can see a cross section here this is a really unique spot. It's an opportunity to see here are the, the trees growing on the top are growing in this little level called the active layer. It's, it's very shallow, so the roots can only go a certain uh, depth and then they have to stop. They hit that frozen, frozen layer. Um, and then the ice is melting away and you see what's left are these unusual termite mound shapes called bijaraks. And, uh, and 
the water that's, that's coming out from this, that's thawing, um, is, is draining right into the waters, into the rivers. They join into the big Kolomo River, and it goes all the way out to the Arctic. And the water looks like this. It's basically like tea brewed from ancient carbon. And uh, as it turns out, this carbon is still very tasty to microbes. And as the microbes munch on this carbon, which is now taken out of the freezer, it's basically like leaving your freezer door open. What's happening now is if permafrost is thawing. Um, the microbes munch on this carbon, and their byproducts are carbon dioxide and methane. Hey, this is methane. It's, this was a very difficult photo shoot for me, right? Not very photogenic subjects. Mud and an invisible gas. Okay, so photographically, kind of challenging. But after the first year, I discovered that as you walk around the edge of these lakes, the bubbles of this methane will come out just all around your feet. If you prod it with a stick, the bubbles of methane will all come out. And so the second year I went back, I brought an underwater camera and managed to capture just how much is coming just from a single step in one of these lakes. Um, in the winter, this gas bubbles up underneath the ice on top of the lake, and Sergei does this little party trick where, I've never seen this, but I've heard about it, where he takes a pickaxe, hits the ice, and then throws a match down, and it makes a big fireball of methane coming out. <laughs> so I'd like to see that. I want to go back. Um, so really, as well, this, so few people have studied this region, this part of the Arctic, that these processes of how the transformation of this carbon from, from the mud, from this permafrost, you know, into the water, into the air, into carbon dioxide and methane, is very poorly understood, and it's not, it's not you know, yet really well represented in the models that are predicting climate change. So the concern is, you know, how, are we, you know, how are these processes happening? How fast are they happening? Um, how are they going to be represented in, in the modeling to, to uh, predict future warming? And so that's really one component of the research. The other is really to get, and this is Max Holmes's real brainchild, is to get these young people hooked on Arctic research and to get them to come back, get them experience in this remote place, so that when they come back, um, that they'll be the new researchers of tomorrow. And so I, I use this slide to finish this section because Aaron Siebold got a Fulbright Fellowship to Norway and Blaise is getting her PhD in Sweden right now in Arctic system science, just two of, uh, of many of the undergraduates that have been so touched by this experience that they went on uh, to continue their studies in it. Now let's go to the complete opposite side of the Earth to Antarctica, a very special place, Ross Island. This is a, a place where Shackleton and Scott staged many of their expeditions uh, over 100 years ago. Now the, getting there is a lot easier. Instead of maybe a several year boat journey with letters back home, uh, it's a five hour flight in an Air Force C-17. Uh, this is a remarkable plane. The whole center section can be taken out and you can roll in a tracked vehicle or a, a drill or any number of scientific equipment, boxes of lettuce. Um, and so when you get off the plane, there's no windows, and you look back at it, and then you, you, you realize you're really happy to get off that plane because you're, you're actually standing on sea ice here on this runway. The ice is only six to 10 feet thick, and that is a very heavy plane. Um, but this is where they land early in the season. Later on in the season, this is actually open water, and they land on the ice shelf, which is uh, thousands of meters thick. So this is Scott's discovery hut is right here, built in 1902. So there's been a bit of urban sprawl since then. Um, it's, uh, you know, in 1956, the uh, McMurdo Station was built. This is the largest research station in Antarctica. About 1,500 people are here at any one time. Uh, but nobody, nobody lives in Antarctica. The whole continent is protected for the, for the primary purpose of just scientific research. So the first thing you do as a scientist when you show up in McMurdo Station is you've, you have to learn how not to die in Antarctica. This is very important, okay, because it's, it's bad for the National Science Foundation if researchers are always turning up frozen. So um, at the, the end of our, first they take us out on the sea ice and they do this camp called Happy Camper Training. And so uh, at the end of it, they say, well, Okay, here's a little simulation. Okay, we, one of your team has gone out to go to the bathroom in a blizzard. Now you have to go find, they didn't come back. You have to go find them. So this is how you try to find them. And if it's not a blizzard out, the buckets will simulate a blizzard. If you don't believe me, you should try it at home. Uh, it works quite well. And the, the bottom line is if you have to go to the bathroom and it's a blizzard, you go in, a, in the pee, pee bottle. You don't go outside. That's the bottom line. So this is a place of, of extreme, Antarctica is just an amazing place of, of incredible scales. This is Mount Erebus, 12,000 foot volcano, quite active. Barn, Barn Glacier is probably 100 meters high. Those tiny little blips on the very bottom side are Weddell Seals. So it's just a, a place of enormous scales that's very hard to comprehend when you're looking at it. This is your first view of penguins. Every one of these tiny little poppy seed dots is, a, is an Adelie penguin. This is Cape Crozier. It's home to about a half million penguins during the breeding season, which is about October to, uh, to uh, February. 
and then babies leave. And this is the kind of terrain they like. They, don't, they, they lay their eggs on, uh, on rocks, and basically on this bare rock. They, they will not lay eggs on ice because the eggs will freeze. Okay, and they make their nests out of these tiny little pebbles. Um, and there's, this is an, an amazing place. As you come over this, this ridge from, from where the, uh, the, the camp is for the researchers, the first thing that hits you is this wave of sound of just half million birds talking to each other. And the next thing that hits you is this wave of smell. Of, uh, you know, it's kind of a fishy barnyard odor. And that's, and that's it. So, the, uh, you know, a deli penguin is a tough little guy. You know, these penguins are very, very hardy. They stand about this tall, but they, they have the, uh, you know, they have the ego of, of, a, of a two meter tall penguin. <laughs> they're, they're very tough. And they, what's neat about peng these deli penguins is they occupy this real knife edge niche of conditions. Just the right amount of sea ice. They're, they're one of two penguin species, only two of them that really depend on sea ice. Emperors are the others. They, they need it for, for a hunting platform and they need it, um, they, they basically, their food hides under it, the little krill and silverfish that they like to eat. Uh, so they depend on sea ice, but too much of it can also be bad. So, and they, they need the right amount of wind to keep the slopes free of snow, but not, but not too much. So they're supremely adapted to this environment. And this is, this is one of those nests that I was talking about with the tiny pebbles. I've watched these penguins pick up a rock at the beach that seemed to be just the perfect size and carry it basically a kilometer up the hill, place it very carefully in the nest, and then they turn around and they go back and try to get another one. Meanwhile, the neighbor takes that one, well, he's even <laughs> puts it in the other nest. Seen it happen, it's quite, it's easy to kind of put a human character on, on penguins if you watch them long enough. So after about a month, uh, these, the eggs, two eggs hatch, they lay two eggs, and so the, the chicks come out, and then the whole sound of the colony changes to this peeping. And then the, uh, the adults go into frantic frenzy mode, of repeated trips back and forth to the sea. And they, uh, they come up to the ice edge, and then all of a sudden they all stop. And they change their calls. What used to be kind of a happy cackling is then turns into a series of grunts. They kind of grunt to each other. Like, eh, eh, eh. And it, it's really what they're saying, I think, is you first. No, you first. No, you first. Because <laughs> nobody wants to be the first one in the water, right? Because this guy might be waiting. And they, uh, leopard seals can take as many as I've seen to meet six penguins in an hour. So they can be quite efficient hunters at the ice edge. Likewise, coming out, you want to get lots of clearance coming out over the ice edge. You don't, know what's, you don't know how tall that ice is at the edge, so the penguins can go up to you know, basically do two-meter jumps as they're coming out of the water in order to clear whatever might, obstacles might be there. Because if they bounce off and fall back in, they're food. Uh, for leopard seals. So also creating nests at this time of year are researchers using the same materials, rocks and uh, a tent design that was, um, that's inspired by Scott's tent design. It's called a Scott tent. So it's basically a hundred year old tent design. So this is where we sleep. We work in these little work tents. This is David Ainley. He's been coming here for 20 years, which is basically the life cycle of a penguin. For three months of a year, he comes here, he poops in a bucket, and he doesn't take a shower. So this is his, this is his office. Okay, this is where he works. He uses some primitive tools like, like nets to do his research and notebooks and bands. So these little bands help identify the penguins. Because to us, they all kind of look the same. They're all black and white, about this tall. Um, I'm sure we all look the same to them. It's like, oh, a giant oversized penguin. Stay away from that one. Um, but uh, so these bands are really critical because they help the researchers track the penguins moving from colony to colony, all these different places. And so I said, Grant, how do you do this? Because you know, I'm not a bird guy. I I'm not really handy with binoculars. He says, well, every, how do you find these things? He said, well, we just use binoculars. We look at every left flipper. We try to look at the left flipper of every bird every 10 days. But the thing is, they're always moving. And this is a time lapse, so I'm cheating a little bit. But you can see here, get an idea of kind of the frenetic pace of the motion of these birds through the colony. And I said, this is, this is just impossible, Grant. I don't know how you do this. Um, but this is just one of the things, one of the tools they use. They also have, those are low tech. So high tech tools are these splash tags. So basically, they attach these to the back of a penguin, shown here with some tape, and then they send the penguin on his way, and, uh, and they always come back, because they're coming back to feed their chicks. And this basically turns the penguin into a moving instrument. It records the temperature of the water, the light level, and the depth that they're diving to catch their food. So in effect, they've, they use the penguins as little sentries to go out, and then now they know what's happening offshore, basically in the water, which is mo where most of the action really takes place when it comes to penguin feeding. Um, and another tool they've used is this, uh, this uh, thing called a waybridge. So in the past, in order to find out what a penguin ate um, and how much they ate, they would hold it upside down, put a tube in its mouth, and then shove some seawater in there, and then it would vomit up its food. And you can imagine that the penguin didn't find that very, uh, a very fun prospect, especially when they get back to the nest and go up to their mate, and they're like, she's like, where's the food? And he's like, well, you wouldn't believe what happened. Uh, 
I was walking over here. This thing grabbed me, made me, you know, like, rah, right, get back out there. Get some more krill now. So you can imagine that, that that doesn't work very well. So this is a more ingenious system. They take a little tag like you use to tag dogs and cats, a little, a little grain of rice tag identifier, and that's a scale. So as the penguins go out of this little gated community, they go over, they weigh themselves, and then when they come back, they weigh themselves again. You know, I went to MIT, so I know a little bit about math. It turns out if you subtract those numbers, you get the weight of what they ate. So um, this is all season long, all the penguins that have been tagged in this little tiny colony um, weigh themselves, and they know exactly how much each penguin ate through the whole year. Uh, so it's a pretty amazing stuff that they're doing there. And so I asked David last week, I said, what have you learned um, in the last 20 years? You know, what's the big thing that we can take away from this? And he said, well, it's fascinating because, you know, at first we, we really wanted to explore this relationship between penguins and the environment. And, and we thought that like the West Antarctic Peninsula, where there's a lot of warming and Adelis are progressively moving south at kind of a rapid rate, being replaced by other more sub-Antarctic species, we were expecting to see, you know, changes like that. But really, the new driver... The new driver for this ecosystem turns out to be fishing. Um, fishing boats have been coming in, taking out a top predator called the Patagonian toothfish. And uh, Patagonian toothfish eats the same food that penguins eat. So if you take out that predator, the penguins have more food. And so the penguin numbers are actually increasing in the Ross Sea because of human activity. Kind of an unexpected result. So these scientists, you know, every time I go out on one of these expeditions, uh, I'm just amazed at what I see, and, uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to share that with you. These scientists are my heroes, and I want to make them yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. I learned you two more Dutch words. Mooi verhaal. You've got mooie boom, mooie verhaal. Good story. Thank you. Um, om een dag als deze te organiseren heb je ideeën nodig. En ik stel me zo voor, Peter en Nelleke, lezen, 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 tijdschriften kopen, bladeren, reizen maken, op het webserver. Uh, de volgende gast, Tom Pul, 